Good morning. You are muted. Now you're, uh, you have to unmute you. No, I can't hear you. Okay, try talking. No. Try going out and coming back in. Yeah, because I see you as your audio is not muted. And you can, if you click next to your microphone, there's an up arrow. And maybe you can select a different mic. Maybe it somehow got disconnected from that mic. And if all else fails, I would suggest going out and coming back in. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, you're frozen. Maybe you are going out. So um, I want to, there's a couple of things that you asked, and I'm just going to, for the recording sake, apologize for not starting it sooner. Um, but we've been talking about restoring relationships, especially with uh, fathers and um, and with uh, people uh, being able to teach people a language of how to relate with us and talk with us, which um, you know we can discuss again in another time. But the question that um, we're responding to right now is, first of all, um, when a when a when somebody passes, what happens to their soul? So I think you know what the story that you have told, which is, and, and I'm just going to kind of summarize what I heard that you, you, the story you shared from, from your te the teachings you've received thus far is that after somebody passes, they have a period of time where they reconcile their human life. Mm -hmm. um, and then they go back into the collective consciousness um, and may at some time as, as an individuated consciousness come out again um, in experience in a reincarnation in another life. Mm -hmm. Whether that is accessible at that point, yeah. specifically that energy. So, that yeah. yeah. So one of the things about um, that I want to get into at this point is, and it's a perfect time for where everyone is at between part one and part two, um, is that time is, is a concept. Time is like a run program. Uh, it's if you can think of your life um, as a series of slides on uh, index cards and your your all the possibilities of your life are like a great big you know um, cabinet that has those drawers like in a library you know and you can pull out this drawer and this is Laura Evansi in this life stream and then maybe if you go to the left and the right of it and up and down of it and around that area, you're going to find all the other possibilities of Laura, right? But if you come way up here, maybe it's Laura is something else, right? But basically this cabinet, when you separate away from source, this is your stream, your data stream. You're going to process through all those drawers. Time is the program that says we start at card one and go through all the drawer all the way to the end because this is the experiential game set and just like a choose your own adventure you can pick within that mm -hmm. you know so time is a run program a concept it's not real all things are so that means that Past lives, even that concept of saying past lives implies that it happened once and it can't be accessed again. It's already passed. As you connect into your higher self the way I teach you, here's what happens. The first thing you do is you become completely aware of this drawer. 
And you're like, holy shit, Jesse, I'm seeing other possibilities of me. Like I, I'm seeing other timelines and choices available to me right now. And I feel like I can see them all. This is higher self-awareness of your drawer. Then you'll start recognizing, oh shit, there's other lifetimes that I've lived. In the past, I was this one. This one time I was this one. I can place it on a linear timeline so it makes sense to me because humans experience things in linear timelines through the drawer set. Eventually, you become aware of the cabinet. You're like, shit, Jesse, I'm a fucking cabinet. I got like all these lives. And I don't know how or why, but I can tap into any one of those lives at any point and be like there. And I feel like when I come back to here, things are different. You realize, oh, I can work in this cabinet. We call that the Akashic. So, and this is what I teach about in the next series, which is Let It Flow. We learn much more about this. But essentially, you guys are in some stage of awareness of this cabinet. And this cabinet separates away from source and has its experiential set. <coughs> now, one other thing you'll find as you begin to build awareness of this cabinet is that in the here and the now, there's more than just you. You'll find there's more yous living here and now, right now, that are just, they look different, they have different names, they live in different parts of the world. You're actually locating in multiple places. And that's why sometimes we have like, that's why we have the capacity to have collective learning, like the hundredth monkey. How does one tribe from one place learning something impact people all around the world? So this is how, because we're very interconnected unconsciously. Um, if you've seen that movie, Us, it's a great example, an illustration. It's just there's more than one of us. So these are things you become aware of as you begin to access higher and higher into consciousness and out of the veil of separation from between the present here and now, because you're in the bubble of the run program of Laura right now. So you have to exit from the bubble to be able to see all of this. So the teachings of the masters for, you know, as long as our recorded history, which is what, um, six, 7,000 years, as far as teachings and things like that, that we really understand and conceptualize, uh, have understood and learned everything within the sphere. But only the ascended masters pass out of the sphere and then look back and know. And very few know how to communicate beyond this because they're trying to understand all of this. It's the program set. You've got to really break the program to step out of it. And that's what I teach is how to begin to recognize this is your one run program. And in this lifetime, in this run program, you're learning how to run all the other programs because that's what this reality set right now is about. Mm. So when somebody passes to get back to your question, so let's say, you know, they're per this person, they are living their life and everything is, is going along and they're having this linear experience and then they die and they come out of the sphere. So when they come out of the sphere, their sphere set, it becomes inert, right? It's no longer the body dies. There's no longer a program running inside and we're collectively in it because this is, this is all of humanity's consciousness, right? So they're outside of it and they want to influence and help. Well, the part of them that still wants to stay here and observing there's no time. <laughs> there's no space. So it's, there's no period or window. Now, the hole that they came through the veil in is very thin. It's like an energy shield. It's, there's a thin space in the veil for a time. And that's what your teacher, I think, is referring to. 
But beyond that, then you have to have both parties, the ones inside and the one outside, capable of hearing through the veil, right? Passing information through the veil. And that's not as common, right? There's less of us on the inside, or more now, but less people on the inside capable of receiving the information. So the illusion is there's only a period of time where you can have the communication. The reality is that my grandfather is an example. Um, I have watched this with other students and clients as well, friends and family. My grandmother was another one who I had this experience with. Do I believe that my grandmother is forever stationed outside of this sphere, anchored there overlooking her ancestors? Yeah, because there's no such thing as time. So I think if any part of her is, that she's always there. And I know now, because of my own connections, I, I, I'm monitoring things, not just here on Earth, but in other places. And I'll notice things out in the cosmos, and then suddenly, oh, there's a new article. <laughs> and sometimes I share those articles. Often I share them because, oh, I've been, that's what I've been experiencing. Here we go. See, humanity is checking in and catching up with all of our, what we are getting intuitively. I'm not the only one, right? So, um, <clears throat> so yes, there's a period of time where it's easier for anyone to be able to connect with their past and loved ones. Um, but it's not that there's, in reality, just this period of time. You have to instead look at it like this. I, as a dead person, no longer in the system, can now look at any part of it. Oh, I, as a living person, decoupling my consciousness from my vessel enough, can go now and do this. And that's what you're, you guys are training to do. But before you can really do that, um, and this is kind of um, how they teach in Kabbalah, you have to start from the ground up. You have to start grounded, working with your root chakra. And just like a rocket ship, you've got to build the platform. Then you got to build the rockets, second chakra. Then you got to build the ship, the identity, third chakra. Then you got to put something in it that has a passion and a drive, an astronaut, a heart. Then you gotta give it a capacity to communicate, not just with itself, with inside, but also with the other people, throat chakra. Then you gotta give it a sensory mechanism so it can read and detect things in its environment, a third eye. And then you gotta have a way to integrate all these systems, the crown. Anything we build has to have these things in order for it to become actualized. As somebody becomes actualized and these systems begin to work online and in complete and total conjunction and alignment with one another, what happens is their Merkaba becomes fully functioning and activated. At that point, I'm going to grab a Merkaba. They are inside the Merkaba. They're inside this. And notice the Merkaba is two pyramids. Mm -hmm. It's two pyramids, one facing up and one facing down, right? The one facing up is us seeking to connect back into and beyond the veil from a grounded platform. The one facing down is that higher connection seeking to insert itself into this grounded earthly system. You have to have both foundations built in order to be able to fully embody God in the creation. This is the true meaning of the difference between the seven chakra column that we see when we look at traditional energy systems and the tree of life that we see when we look at Kabbalah. Do you know what the tree of life looks like? It also <clears throat> looks like a pentagram. Kind of. It's got the crown, mm -hmm. and then it comes to either side. 
and it comes down in two columns on either side and then comes back to the root mm. and the central column in, in the inside of it and they are all connected by lines. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, <coughs> I think I've got one nearby right now. <coughs> No. <clears throat> it's in um, part two in the body. There's an image of the, of the full um, tree of life. And in order to activate your tree of life, what it states is you have to start from the root and build your first, your rocket ship in order to launch. This is your vehicle, your light body vehicle, your Merkaba. And once you build this light body, it takes you up to sleep. And what I teach you guys, when I have you guys ride that Gaia connection up into source, that's what you're doing. You're building your upward facing triangle. If you start in the other direction, that's what we see those healers that are just way the fuck out there and you have a hard time relating to them. And their lives are a chaos, but they're like, but I'm so enlightened. But they have no capacity to take this and do anything with it. They have been building from the top down. Do they burn out quick? Yeah. Notice that I too. They can't handle the energy. And this is why I start you guys the way I do. You got to spend as long as you need. Because if you're going to become a bodybuilder, if you don't spend that time in the beginning building up fine muscle attachments, strengthening muscle connections to bones, building your tendons, building up your cartilage and strengthening it with your nutrients as well as your movement and exercise in small ways, as you then get into the bigger muscular things, you get, those are the guys who get muscle bound, they get locked up, they can't move really quickly, they end up with arthritis. I mean, even Arnold Schwarzenegger had to combat his muscle boundness, right? So this is um, the same concept. You've got to first build this whole upward facing triangle that is the foundation of your ability and capacity and acceptance to be here. As long as we hate being here, we are shattering our upward facing vehicle, it's like building a rocket ship, getting pissed off at night and taking a sledgehammer to it every day. And then you got to, yeah. Can you, can you put that up close, like a little closer? I'm trying, but the camera's not. Oh, yeah, no, that's okay. I just wanted to see. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So, our upward facing triangle, the, here's the other part people face when they get into this work. They build, let's say they build the upward facing triangle, they're building their chakra system, they're doing it. But they're like, I don't know what to do with it then. So they get all this connection, but they still don't know how to bring back down that connection into the create creation. So that's part two of life math. That's the let it flow series. And that's bringing and building your, how do I, what do I go with? Why do I want to go tune into the sun? Why do I want to go tune into Jupiter? Why do I want to tune into the galactic center? Why do I want to tune into the universal center? Why do I want to go beyond those? How on earth would it benefit me to connect outside of the entire reality set of human consciousness exploration? And tune into, I don't know, Arcturian, or I don't know, maybe Pleiadian. Why would I want to enter these other reality sets? How can that help me? Well, I know how, but it's only because of experience of going there, seeing the stories, and trying to bring them back in. Practicing, which is building the second part of our Merkaba. Once we build the Merkaba, a rocket ship builder, let's say you decide you're going to be a, a rocket engineer. You don't start by going and building the rocket and launching it. I mean, some people do. Look at SpaceX, you know. <laughs> but 
there's a lot of death and destruction. There's a steep learning curve. It's very hard. You start by learning systems, building systems, building practices, and getting experience. What is my full experiential set with rocket fuel? Now I need to understand what are other possible fuel sources. And now I need to start understanding whether, what are other kinds of drive mechanisms that maybe don't even need that fuel source. I could go into, in total detail, one point on this Merkaba and explore completely motivation and drive and become focused solely on the uh, solar plex. Who am I? And there are people who do that, masters that specialize on those things. Or I can focus on the whole thing. That's kind of more like what I am. I'm more of a jack of all trades. So I get enough information about the things that make sense to me and I recognize it for me. I'm like, if I need to know more, it'll come to me. So right now, I'm teaching you guys the upward facing triangle. When this light body, this vehicle, we call this a vehicle, is complete, your consciousness can go out of, out of this reality set can go out of the full sphere set. You can travel anywhere. And this is how aliens travel to us, most of the ones that are not still physically dependent. So that would be anything <laughs> sixth density, seventh density, Arcturians, Ple uh, Pleiadians still have ships, but um, they still also use their Merkaba as a consciousness vehicle. But their physical body, when they want their physical body to travel, that's sixth density. Seventh densities are the ones that they basically, their consciousness comes in, they coalesce around them, the atoms to make a body, and they become a vehicle here. That's like what Toph, yeah. you know, if we look at ancient Egypt, the, a lot of those gods, that's where they come from. These kinds of other consciousness beings coming into our reality set, coalescing material around their consciousness, making a body, and sometimes it looks like an animal, right? So... Um, these are, so you were asking, I know your, your question was simple, right? How long do I have to talk to my dad after he's died, really? How do I restore my relationship, really? Well, there's no such thing as time, in my opinion, in my experience. So um, the only question is, can I communicate beyond this veil? Can I hear beyond it? Can I choose to go back in time to a reality set where he was? still alive. I've done some of that too. There's all different kinds of ways we can show up in this. Uh, does that answer your question though? Yeah. Probably give you some more. <laughs> Always. <laughs> is that Rachel? Uh, this is Laura. Oh, hi Laura. <laughs> How are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, do you guys have any other questions? We've got, um, let's see, We've got about I 10 actually, minutes. Yeah, I do. And it's so funny because I just, I thought this started at 12, so I'm sorry for jumping on late. No, it's fine. Yeah. But, um, um, and I, so I had some questions. It's so funny when I jumped on too that you were talking about the Merkaba because I'm, I, I shared with Jesse yesterday how I found this little nugget in the woods. It's this beautiful, like, Oh my gosh. So last night I um, decided <clears throat> to like really look at it really closely. And um, cause I've just been so intrigued with how clear it is. And um, I turned it over and I started looking at the bottom of it and there's like these, there's like a, um, it's like there's symbols on the bottom of it. Mm. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I'm just like, okay what is this? What is all this? You know, I, I mean, like, I know I was led to this little thing and it was yeah. really cool, but when I saw the symbols on it, I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when you were just speaking and I jumped on right as you're holding that thing up, I'm just, I kept thinking that somehow this is, um, it might be kind of related to that. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to just, I'm looking for something to show you guys um, while you're telling the story. So, um, you know, <clears throat> you're going to find things more and more just uh, showing you how all those stories that you had as a kid in your mind of connections and 
things, fairies, elves, all of it. It's all just real. Um, and you're going to start getting these um, introductions like this into that world, uh, just like that. Mm -hmm. So you it's know, the first time this has ever happened to me. So I'm like, whoa. <laughs> right. Um, you know, one of my good friends. Ah, I think this is it. <clears throat> yes. So I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but these are all ancient magical symbols that oh. for a long time. Um, and if you'd like, I can photocopy this and send yes. it. Okay. Yes. I'll just post it. How about I'll post it in the group, the HPC okay. group. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, my um, Jeffrey um, St. Rose, who makes the Starseed Oracle deck that um, I have here, if anybody wants to purchase it, uh, it's, um, he's a wizard. And he was a Mormon, you know, he was a devout Mormon, and he just always felt different and was raised in a very isolated community in Utah. And, you know, he started awakening and hearing wizards talking to him. And now he's a translator, basically a channeler for this wizard order that is based all the wizards of humanity um, that are the ascended masters in that tone and frequency rather than spirituality or consciousness work. Um, they, when they pass, they enter into the, this order that the passing from this vessel is their, their ascension into the order. And they, uh, so he brings in all kinds of information and he was intuitively guided to build a portal or in his home. Uh, so he built in his living room, he has a big area rug in the center of his living room. And the boundary of that rug is a copper portal made of, oh. um, each intersection point has different crystal nodes, um, and it's pretty big. It's about this wide, um, and uh, there's all kinds of things since a grid of, I'm talking like quartz spheres, like this big uh, chunks of lab. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, un it's unreal. You, uh, I walked in there, I'm all, I'm gonna go sit on the couch. <laughs> I'm gonna pass out now. <laughs> And I was out for about an hour and a half. Uh, and he, at one point he was like, I'm getting that I need to do some activation codes for you. And my eyes switching right now. I'm like, okay. And I don't know what happened after that, but like I was gone. Um, so this is a very, very powerful, powerful place that he's built in his home. <clears throat> um, and he's had things drop from the sky. So there's like a string of orange beads hanging from his chandelier kind of off to the side. And I was like, so what's that for? Because everything's intentional in this dude's home, right? I'm like, so what's that for? He goes, ah, I just can't reach it and I don't want to get the ladder. And I'm like, but why did you put it there in the first place? He goes, I didn't. It just dropped down during one of our ceremonies. Wow. So these things, they come uh, for us. What you found was for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm getting a strong sense that it's, it's going to help awaken in you the connection to the other life streams where this, you were probably writing it. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, uh, I just was like, what is this for? Like, I mean, I just knew. Powerful. And I'm just not going to let it bug me. I guess I'll just, it'll all come. And that's what. I was at, I just, I texted you thinking this was a trouble. Go, Jesse, can you talk for a second? And I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> got to jump on. Yep. Yeah. So, um, we will get these things delivered to us. Um, for myself, I had fairies, um, in my home that I got guided to. I was going to, um, I like to harvest my own foods. So, uh, I go out and harvest my blueberries or, you know, different things like that during the summer. And uh, a few years ago, I thought it'd be really cool to run meditations and then go harvest our food together. Uh, mm. so I was trying to do that. And um, <laughs> nobody else, I guess, wanted, you know, most people don't still har do that. They don't keep, they're like, I've got a grocery store. Um, so uh, I was going with a friend and nobody was, else was coming. We decided we'd go anyway. And my GPS took us out into the mountains, basically. And she's like, Jesse, I don't think there's any blueberry patches out here. And now we're on this little logging road that this coyote was laughing at us as we drove down. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm like, yeah, but something's here. I mean, there's, there's a reason that we've been guided out here. 
And uh, I also know <laughs> to not bring anything back in, from the forest unless I feel it's very strongly meant for me to be brought back, to be, you know, to bring it back. Because, you know, yeah. forests have lot, lots of stuff going on in them. Uh, yeah. And so I didn't bring anything back. But uh, after that, I started having just constant stuff happening at home. Like um, meat would go missing from my freezer. Or like I'd pull out a steak and a frozen, frozen solid steak and like a bite is missing from it. Wow. Or ice cream. You know, I don't buy Rocky Road ice cream. I've, I have never in my life purchased Rocky Road ice cream. I like it, but... Um, and uh, a half-eaten tub of Rocky Road ice cream appears in my freezer after I'm bitching about, could you quit eating everything out of here? Like, if you're going to eat some, bring something back. Come on. So they well, brought me ice cream. I don't know whose fridge they stole that from, but... Um, and, when, and they also tried to communicate with me. They started getting very offended at how my ex-husband was behaving. Mm. <coughs> so I came home one night after we'd had a huge fight. And there's 47 pennies all over my living room floor. And he was 47 years old. And there was one penny lodged in the, dish, in the garbage disposal so badly that even when I took it apart, I couldn't get it out. We had to replace it. Hmm. Uh, so these were all messages and communications, you know. So that's, um, you guys are going to, as you go on this journey and you say, I don't need permission to access beyond the veil anymore. Right, because that's a collective agreement, basically. It keeps us enslaved. As you say, I don't need permission to go beyond the veil. You are going to find yourself connecting not only with all sorts of beings in this reality set that we live in, but also from outside. So, so Jesse, like for me, it was a strong yes to take it. Oh, for you, and, it then, was, and I agree, a hundred and ten percent. Yeah. Um, as you were saying that, I thought, oh, maybe, uh, literally, I might actually go back there today and put something else back. Good. You know that's, what I mean? That's, that's the next that's, step. I'm glad that you caught that. I was just thinking, just as you were saying that, I want to go back and just put something. I don't know what, but something just for, for them. Because, and I even wondered, like, I, last night, and I think I went against my intuition, but I was like, I was finding some fear, like I was going, well, do I, do I need to sage this? And um, I, I was going to put it in salt water, and then I'm like, no, no, no. And then I said, okay, my mother's going to sage it. And then when I did, I was like, nope, but I, I did it, and then I washed it off. And then I was like, you know what I mean? Because I was just getting into all this, like, I don't know what this is for, like, you know? So, um, so then that becomes fear programming you're releasing. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> this is about, then that becomes about like protection and energy and how safe am I? Yeah. Uh, and that would be one end of the polarity. And the other end of the polarity of that same spectrum would be, uh, I call everything to me to teach me and learn. Mm. So it's just a choice of where you want to show up on that spectrum. Uh, do I think you needed to sage that thing? I hear no. When no. I why I hear because the energies that are attached to it are the whole reason you were drawn to it in the first. Exactly, place. and I freaking knew it too. It so was just yeah. the conflict within you was what I know to be true versus what I'm sensing right now. Will mm -hmm. I give myself permission? And that's what I'm really like. I've noticed as I've started this. I don't. Um, just that that discernment and every time I follow it's just like that exercise you did with Heidi and I last night yeah it was like just that just super quick like yep nope yep, yep. Nope. nope and I yeah so yeah. um yeah so I'm that's the whole goal of life mastery is yeah. and, and believe it or not it's gonna take you a while to get mm -hmm. to the point where you're, you're, as soon as you ask a question, you choose to use the yes, no. And then yeah. it's going to take a little longer of that, and then it becomes integrated, right? Yeah. As How are you talking, feeling with that, Laura? Oh. Um, with the yes, no. I was feeling that a lot stronger before Jesse and I did energy work. 
like I was feeling more tension and stuff in my third eye and my heart for yeses. And now it's dissolved a little, to be honest. I'm not sure why. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know if Jesse can say anything about that. Um, I feel like it's, it could be that I've just been pretty overwhelmed lately by a lot of other things in my life. So really getting to a quiet space and spending um, more intentional time um, with myself to find those answers would probably yield better results. <laughs> well, yeah. and also, also like for, for me, like with the yes and no, cause yesterday when we were trying to, you know, she tried it, to it was re- for the energy lab last night. Laura, and, What's that? Uh, Julie came to the energy lab last night. Right. And everything that could go wrong went wrong for her. Like she couldn't meditate, her kid kept coming out, she couldn't get comfortable, then she got locked out of her house, and she was like, It's like, how bad do you want to be here, Julie? Right, it was really interesting, yeah. Um, But what I was going to say, though, too, was that, yeah, is... For me, like I was start, I was looking up like you know, clairaudience, clairvoyance, clairsentience, and all that stuff. And for me, with that um, yes and no, um, <coughs> it's just to me, it's like an automatic yes. It's an automatic no. It's not even something that I feel like I'm feeling. In fact, when I try to feel it, it actually makes it harder. Hmm. I Thanks just feel it. It, it, and I noticed that last night and it was just like, no, just yes, just no. And I even noticed that even when I was telling you about the stone clearing, it was like, no, you don't need to do this, you know? Yeah. So and that's why so it was um, that the tone was more humorous or was the tone more um, excitable somehow, like larger letters that you're seeing? I guess I'm confused. I know it's different for everyone, and I'm sure it peaks and va- and has valleys like all other things, right? So for some people, and this is what I introduced. Like, telling you, you know what I mean? Like, are you convincing yourself when you already kind of have an idea of what you want to do or what you want to hear? Like knowing the difference between that piece, which I don't yeah. know where it comes from, just attachments of the ego versus what your intuitive higher self is suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. So this Mine's is why when we first introduced the compass to you guys. I ask you to note any differences, physiological, emotional, energetic, intuition, ideas, because you're going to have different sensory sensors coming online at different rates and different places and different times. And uh, as you use this, this, Cool. Whether you're using it for feeling physiologically the alignment or you're feeling and, and my end goal is for you to get to where you're physiologically feeling it. The reason I want you to get to the point where you're physiologically feeling it is that means you're flowing energy. Okay. You know, it's building your endurance. Like you can sit there and theorize about your muscle building exercises, which is wonderful. But until you actually start lifting the weights, you're not going to build strength. Just conceptualizations. So, so be in awareness of like when that's a yes and no, what you're feeling. Uh, ju- uh, yes. And, and, and feel like I like to think of it in terms of alignment. Yes, I'm in alignment. And so in my mm-hmm. mind, I'm creating this idea of this stream flowing. Yes. Uh, seeking question, receiving answer, seeking question, receiving answer. Oh, mm-hmm. this, by the way, does this remind you guys of something that I just was showing you? Mm-hmm. Seeking, questioning, bringing the answer. Seeking the question, bringing the answer. Strengthening this. And if I do it for something innocuous like, is this coffee good for me right now? Oh, I know it's not. Right? It seems <laughs> no big deal. But that's going, oh. Is this phone supporting my business right now? Yes. Ugh. Is this the best color pen? Ugh, yes. Do I use these color to? Yes. I'm just weightlifting. I'm building my strength. I'm building my endurance. So then when I'm all like, is this lover really good for me? <laughs> right? <laughs> And then the information. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm fooling myself. Is this lover good for me? Right? 
<laughs> now you're learning discernment. Is this stress is pushing this like this good for me right now? No. Okay. okay so then what do we do if like, okay, so we'll take the, the, the staging, the, the, whatever it is. I don't even know if I can call it a stone. Let's um, a bobble. A what? A bobble. <laughs> okay. So, and then you choose to do something against what you know. Yeah. Then, then what? Because then you're like, okay, um, did I just fuck observe. everything up? You observe. There's no such thing as fucking it up. That's just saying in my choose it in your own adventure, normally I always pick the left path. But this time I'm going to try the right path. Is it fucking anything up? No, it's just a different adventure. Now mm -hmm. observe. Did it actually support me in the past to always choose the right path? Is this an exciting adventure? Does this support me? Or am I learning lessons that I feel are distracting me from what is my life purpose right now? Uh, okay. Right. And another point you asked about was, um, you know, discernment. If every time I'm going, is this coffee good for me? Ugh, right. Mm -hmm. And I get the no, no. I'm like, but I really want it to be good for me. So the next time I ask, I'm like, is it now good for me? Yeah. Is it good for me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's good for me. Oh, but it didn't end up. I got really bad tummy ache, but I thought it was good for me. I got the yeah. Mm -hmm. So as I do this, yeah. Then I start to learn. I'm not saying, is this good for me? I'm saying, yeah. And I learned the difference between my yes, I'm trying to convince myself versus mm -hmm. my uh, yes or no. Just like as you begin weightlifting, you're lifting big, powerful, heavy weights. You're like, I can just, with this little five pounder, I can just, it's good, I'm good. But now as this gets heavier, ugh, oh wait, I'm now noticing I twist my arm as I lift it. And I, I'm not sure if that's good or not. Is that good for my muscles? Well, let's see, I'll do it today and then I'll see how sore am I tomorrow. Oh no, I injured myself now. Shit, don't do it that way. But now I know how to recover from an injury. So if I get hurt in the battle, I, I know I'm okay. Right? You're just practicing. You're building so the capacity it, it, to discern. Is, it, is this my yes? Or is this my yes? They're both a lit. But is one an illusion that I create for myself, that I guide myself down lesson sets and then it's not even don't do that it's just go oh i got the orange light on i'm investigating right now cool i'm observing hmm. you will know when you are in an illusory state where you're creating your reality because you're attached to it versus Fuck. witnessing it is your, your ability it true yeah go ahead laura is your ability to discern affected by substances like alcohol and marijuana? Definitely affected by alcohol. I don't discern when I have alcohol. I assume it's all good to go. I even hear it in my head. We're good to go. Literally, it's a voice like that. Anyway, Every wait, wait. Like, what was that, Jesse? And I'll even talk that way when I've been drinking a lot. <laughs> wait, what, did, but what was your answer? I didn't hear that. Jesse, that sh your answer to the question she said Some is alcohol. Alcohol is a substance that definitely d um, dampens my capacity to discern. Yeah. Um, marijuana doesn't have that effect for me. It does for other people. Um, so I don't know if that's, I'm not going to give you a universal answer. Um, from my experience, I have a lot of friends who um, I've known for a long time who are incredibly gifted I go to them and, and suddenly I'm just receiving messages straight from the divine. Their lives are a mess, but um, they drink heavily and smoke cigarettes and eat at McDonald's. And, you know, <laughs> so I can't give you a universal answer on whether or not they do or they don't. Hmm. Um, I, what I can say is that anything we do that prevents us from being able to build a foundation to work from is inhibiting us. Mm -hmm. So anything like what I don't like about alcohol is I feel very like off balance. 
I feel like a top that's kind of spinning with a wobble. You know? um, so, uh, and I also have very poor discernment over, now this, this up-down process of seeking and pulling in, there's something else that's happening here. Does this remind you of anything? Mm. What about like a piston and an engine? Oh, yeah. Or a top with the press that we press it up and down. What happens as we do this more? In a piston? Faster. Yeah, we get more energy, more drive. Yeah. So um, let's say I use a substance that like DMT, mm -hmm. right? I got a shit ton of drive, but where am I going with it? In circles. Mm -hmm. Up. <laughs> In circles. So, up. <laughs> so most people use these substances and they don't know what to do with it. It's, it's like a student in a car revving the engine, but doesn't know yet how to put it into gear. Right. So this is what you're doing. You're building your capacity to drive your own energetic vehicle. You're learning your drive mechanisms, all of that. So that's why I want you to do things like go for a walk and decide, use your compass to go left or right. Use your compass to pick which book to buy. Use your compass to choose the foods. Then use all the other things that you've been using. Mm-hmm. And so what have you noticed when um, just being someone who's been in practice or, you know, using your, using that compass and when you know what, it, you know, you're supposed, you know, something is supposed to be a certain way, a yes or a no, and you go against it and, um, or you go for it. It's kind of what Laura was saying. So like, um, so what so I have so learned, the coffee, the coffee part, like yeah, when you so like, you really want I've the learned. coffee. Yeah. If, if, um, first of all, if I believe something to be true, the moment I start thinking this is an absolute truth, mm -hmm. that's when the universe shows me all the ways it's actually not. <laughs> but, see, so, and that's the thing I always choose the wrong based. Okay. Seeking truth as the end goal is like seeking the point where your tail begins and ends. It's a chasing circle. So um, truth is a drive mechanism for exploration of information beyond your comfort level. Anger Got is it. a vehicle for you to puncture the veil of your own fear to express yourself. It's the vehicle that allows you to express a blocked emotion, right? So these things are vehicles. How you use them, that's up to you. Mm -hmm. Now truth, most people use truth as a justification. If I find the truth, then I'm right and I can tell other people they're wrong because I know the truth. But when you start seeing that all truth is perspective-based, it's true from my vantage point from this experiential set. When you can start doing that, then you can start seeing the multiplicities of reality that are existing around you. You're building your discernment of that. Now, have I led myself into, into situations that now, looking back, I wish I hadn't? Heck yeah. Has my compass taken me down roads and I'm like, fuck you, compass? Yes. <laughs> and that's how I learned how I create illusions for myself hmm. and that I can be so complete in it that I will ignore all the other signs that are showing me because I fixated on one body sensation and I learned how to make it all by myself. Hmm. Yeah. Cause sometimes it's really hard to not take the piece of candy in the candy jar. So, you know, I just take it and, and, and then observe what happens when I do. Ah, got I, it. Really true that if I eat that candy, my ass is going to be bigger. Is it really right. true that if I have that alcohol, I'm going to not be able to function? Is it really true? I mean, maybe you're just checking in on something. Is this really true? There's a lot. The flu, 
human collective agreements that we are subjected to that you guys are going to start breaking. One of them right, is it, protection, right? Because mm-hmm. like I feel like you can choose things and it just creates just a, there can be a fluidity in that choice. Like something might be right one time and then it won't be right and you just kind of follow it and it doesn't always make sense. Exactly. Like staying up at four o'clock in the morning might be great sometimes when you have to get up at four o'clock the next, or, you know, six o'clock the next day. Exactly. But it's that judgment around it that just me, I don't know. Anyway. And yeah. oftentimes you're giving yourselves opportunities to practice so you can release the judgments because at some yeah. point it may be critical that you're up at 4 a.m. And you won't sit there going, no, no, I should be asleep right now. You'll mm-hmm. cross that and you'll get up. And maybe your guidance is going to be telling you, you got to go outside right now. But if you don't trust yourself and you haven't built that relationship with yourself, because that's what you're doing now, you're building a communication with yourself. You're not asking Sam, Sam, is it okay for me to go out at 4 a.m.? Is that a good idea? Sam doesn't fucking know. (laughs) Sam's not needed somewhere at 4 a.m. You are. And so if you have judgments in place that say, there's no fucking way I'm getting out of my bed at 4 a.m. and going outside, oh, <laughs> you just declared a truth. Now the universe asks, is it really true? Well, what's it going to take? And it might be something horrible because that's how resistant we are. Mm. And then once we get to the point where, fuck, it's not that bad being out at 4 a.m., it's nice actually it's kind of quiet those birds are really loud and the sun's just coming up and there's nobody here i have to deal with and wow wait all the consciousnesses around me are asleep but i'm not i'm receiving information at a different level oh i might even look out my window and see an alien ship that will come down because most people around me are sleeping yeah fucker just look up (laughs) you never look up (laughs) exactly So when we make truths and declarative statements about ourselves, the universe then is being given a challenge. We're literally thumbing our nose at ourselves. And usually the declarative statement is in direct opposition to what we need to do next the most. I would never talk about someone behind their back. And then I actually have to have that conversation because my friend from childhood's son is sitting in my, in my home, homeless, strung out, trying to figure himself out. And he's like, why am I like this? I know I had a good life and I'm just a selfish brat. Okay, honey, let me give you the reality of what I've observed that you went through. And, and I doubt you'll be able to question again why you're where you at. Does that mean I don't love my friend? No. Am I bad now that you're behind your back? She might think so. But am I giving truth to this boy who's lost and confused? Yes. And is that what I'm called to do in this moment? Yes. So if I've got this idea that loyalty looks like I never speak out, I never blah, 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 which her mother, his mother, right. are the people that made me learn that, that loyalty is for dogs and bitches, not me. Right. So am I going to then be again confronted with that challenge as I'm learning how, as now I work with couples and families and individuals that are all interconnected with each other? Well, how do I navigate that? Maintaining privacy, maintaining my own respect of, you know, their sovereignty. I'm not really a licensed therapist, so I don't, you know what I mean? What are my boundaries around that going to be? Ah, oh, I'm going to have experiences that I have to ask myself that question in relationship to my that will come to me in my personal life. It's not clients I'm having that hard time understanding that with. It's in my personal life, my best friend from childhood son. So by navigating those waters and then having to talk to her and be like, well, yeah, Brenda, I get that you don't understand why your son would be doing meth. And I hear you wanting to believe that you didn't do meth in front of him. I attended parties with prostitutes and math addicts and drug dealers where your kids were playing all around you guys. That's why I didn't bring my son. That's why I stopped coming to your parties. And that's just what I saw and I only attended two. 
though I love you, but we all fuck up in our children's eyes. So we can accept that and just move on. Yeah. You know, because I know where she was at and I know why she was there. And I know that's not where she is now. So I don't have to judge her and say, oh, Brenda, you're such a horrible mother because you did that. But I can with her son say, it was horrible that you had to experience that. So as I learned to navigate those waters of judgment, compassion, support, being the mirror, being the, ja the jackhammer, being the whatever I have to be for these people, I have to release the beliefs that I hold that are rigid values that say I will or I will not do these things. According to Bashar, there's only three universal laws. Everything that is, is. Everything that is, is subject to change. And all that is, is temporary. That's it. So we apply stories to those laws. And my goal with you guys is not to take away all your stories, but to get you conscious authors. Why do I always make the fairy tale about a damsel in distress? Why do I always make the villain a blah, blah, blah? Why do I always play the part of the blah, blah, blah? So that then you can go, okay, well now I'm not gonna make the blah, blah, blah my main character, but I sure know how to write that one well. No. And eventually you'll get to where you're doing it on the fly. And then you're in flow state all the time. And it's just what do you observe as what pulls you out of that flow state, right? Because mm -hmm. you're already, you, it's <coughs> not like you've got right on your side, your, your team, you got this little earbud, and they're there, they're telling you, but your compass is like a great big tuning dial. Can I hear it? Yeah, I might tune into other frequencies too that way, but can I get to where I'm hearing this one? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, I want you guys to a point where you're just tuning into frequency, where when I hold this crystal up, you can tune into the consciousness of this frequency. There's no illusion in your mind that says it's just a rock. There's no idea, well, it's all the way at Jesse's. I can't really tune into it. And there's no uh, fear of how do I process and integrate. There's no uh, lacking platform to integrate crystalline consciousness. Because as you connect into Source and Gaia, you're connecting to crystalline frequencies. What does crystalline mean? Ah, everything aligns to a single direction. There's a regularity to the formation. That's all crystalline means. I'm orienting to yes. I'm orienting to yes. I'm orienting to yes. I'm just aligning. That's all. Yes is where I choose to focus it because it's an easy focus point. If I learn to focus it between a yes and a no, these two focus points, now I can align to this. Now I can do that. Look, now I can go here. Now I'm here. Oh, look, now it's a dance. Now it's fun. But at first I'm all like, fuck, what do I do? Just like learning a speaking pattern. <laughs> Black yeah. is a bitch, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so that. when when we're in a, a place where we've we've we're observing and we actually can recognize that we're in observation of something, um, then what is the what is that? Because I mean, I've been observing things in a way, and I just go, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll just kind of ask, so now what do I do with it? Like, um, Nothing. You're in a doer state. You got to slip mm. into the beer state. Because the mm. beer has the next thing come. You got to hold what you're, at, what you're holding until the next thing comes. Okay. Yeah, that's the thing that Heidi and I were talking about last night. Because we're just like, oh, now we've got to do something. Now we got to. <laughs> we're just, we're so. Doer, um, there's a great guy, Ron. Hubbard, I think, is out, uh, Ron, he's, he's connected to me on Facebook. Um, he has a whole lecture on the doer versus the beer. And he's like, you know, basically, there's the self. And you come in, you're on, you're active, and you separate a part out from yourself. I guess not that one. 
that becomes <laughs> this doer. This doer is going to go do something. And it's now separated from self. And it has this desire to get back into self because it views itself as separate. So uh. by doing, it can get back in because doing is how it got out. But being is how it gets back in. Got it. Especially if you have any identities around, I need to do something in order to be worthy of. Yeah. Um, who am I of worth to be connected to God? Who am I to be hearing the angels? Who am I to blah, blah, blah. Wow. All right. So we're almost, we're coming up on um, 1130. I have a session at 12, so I'm going to let you guys know. Um, but this is yeah. awkward, So if there's anything else, what were you saying, Laura? Yeah. Scheduling stuff, as far as what I have on my big ass calendar right here, um, I got from your emails that every second and fourth Sunday is your energy exchange potluck. Saturday. Oh, it's Saturday? Saturday. Yeah, I changed them to Saturdays because too many of the people who work want to be able to yeah. see later and they can't. Cause they have to too many of us that have to be at our freaking eight to five <laughs> at this point. Too many of you guys who are serving. Okay, so it's, so it's right every right second working. and fourth Saturday for certain for yeah. that. Yeah. And then the movie okay. is the third Saturday of every month. The movie night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And they all start at five, right? Yep. All start at five. Okay. Second and fourth and then third. So basically second, third, and fourth, there's things that are available. And when I'm ready to, I'll incorporate the first Saturday as something, but I'm doing a fair in Hillsboro every weekend, the first weekend of every month. So it would have to be something out, right? Like um, going out to dinner, maybe going to see music. Nobody's expressed Fine. interest in the music, so I'm probably not going to do that this point, this uh, next month. But um, I'm also working on, you know, everything, getting everything else going. So <clears throat> it'll. I love it'll that that you do that that social part because it's so nice to just I don't know be with like-minded people. It was so nice coming to your house for that movie night. Good. Yeah, I feel yeah. like that's the most important part really um is tribe and that's mm -hmm. what i felt like was lacking in my training program mm -hmm. when i was in training so um mm -hmm. it, i it's important to me and i'm glad that they're starting to pick up and that people are utilizing them because i feel like you know that's all i can really do is provide things and then if people show up then wonderful you know yeah. Like even this, I'm like, I just show up for this and I, my, I have a stack of work I can do next to me if no one shows, but it's devoted at the time that I'm here working, you know. Um, Super grateful. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Bye, Laura. See you, Julie. Take care. Bye. Have a good day. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm. See you. Thank you, Jessica. Bye. You're welcome. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.